I was thinking when I wrote this book that that something we we are pretty good at is educating. You know, we, we still haven't quite actually ended the war in Iraq, but we, meaning meaning peace activists, meaning people who care and agitate and organize, uh, convinced a majority of Americans that the war was a bad idea several years ago, um, despite the efforts of the corporate media. And so it occurred to me that it would be very useful if there was a way to not just get rid of one particular war, but to get rid of all wars. And a fantasy, or a dream of the easy way to do it, would be if there already existed a law that banned all wars, and all we had to do was tell people about it. All we had to do was educate. All we had to do was build the events and the websites and the independent media and get the word out the same way we've done with other things and let people know. And it wouldn't mean that that law was enforced immediately, but it would be a huge step in the right direction. It would be, you know, a dream compared to what we're actually up against. Except that there really is such a law. There has been a law on the books since 1929 that bans all wars. And so, you know, when the, when the corporatists and the militarists and the people who are now called the defenders of the 1% uh, want to rewrite laws, they will go and dig up notes in the margins by court reporters on ancient court rulings and call that law. They will, you know, Carl, uh, Carl uh, John Yu, our, our guest here in, in Charlottesville last year, uh, actually made legal arguments in his memos based on Nixon's veto of the War Powers Act, even though the veto was overridden, speeches that Bush had made, you know, stuff that just isn't law, including, uh, including very prominently uh, crazy readings of Federalist papers, which were never laws. And, and so it's, it's frustrating, but it's an opportunity that on our side, on the side of peace and justice, there are actually laws on the books, indisputable laws down in writing, available on the government's own websites that go beyond our wildest imagination for what we might hope to achieve. You know, we would never, we would never dare to dream in this period, in this time and place, of trying to ban all wars. Right? We might try to ban the really bad wars or the non-humanitarian wars, or we might try to prevent a particular war and dream of someday trying to ban them and so forth. But we actually have a law already on the books that goes way beyond, that, that very intentionally criminalizes all war. The good wars, the bad wars, the humanitarian wars, the evil wars, all wars. And, and, and so what do we do with this that, that we have that we never could have dreamed of even trying to produce. Um, and, and when we realized that somehow our great grandparents not only thought they could do this, but did it, it makes you stop and think, well, what was happening in the 1920s? What were they doing? What were they thinking that was making them do it that allowed them to imagine something we can't even imagine and achieve it? Uh, and, you know, can we make use of what they accomplished, but how did they accomplish it? And, and so that's really the topic of my book, and I, I'll just read the, some of the very beginning words to give you an idea. Um, there are actions we widely believe are and should be illegal. Slavery, rape, genocide. War is no longer on the list. It has become a well-kept secret that war is illegal and a minority view that it should be illegal. I believe we have something to learn from an earlier period in our history, a period in which a law was created that made war illegal for the first time, a law that has been forgotten but is still on the books. In 1927-1928, a hot-tempered Republican from Minnesota named Frank, who privately cursed pacifists, managed to persuade nearly every country on earth to ban war. He had been moved to do so against his will by a global demand for peace and a U.S.
U.S. partnership with France, created through illegal diplomacy by peace activists. The driving force in achieving this historic breakthrough was a remarkably unified, strategic, and relentless U.S. peace movement, with its strongest support in the Midwest, its strongest leaders, professors, lawyers, and university presidents, its voices in Washington, D.C., those of Republican senators from Idaho and Kansas, its views welcomed and promoted by newspapers, churches, and women's groups all over the country, and its determination unaltered by a decade of defeats and divisions. The movement depended in large part on the new political power of female voters. The effort might have failed had Charles Lindbergh not flown an airplane across an ocean, or Henry Cabot Lodge not died, or had other efforts toward peace and disarmament not been dismal failures. But public pressure made this step, or something like it, almost inevitable. And when it succeeded, although the outlawing of war was never fully implemented in accordance with the plans of its visionaries, much of the world believed that war had been made illegal. Wars were, in fact, halted and prevented. And when, nonetheless, wars continued and a Second World War engulfed the globe, that catastrophe was followed by the trials of men accused of the brand new crime of making war, as well as by global adoption of the United Nations Charter, a document owing much to its pre-war predecessor while still falling short of the ideals of what in the 1920s was called the outlawry movement. Quote, Last night I had the strangest dream I'd ever dreamed before, wrote Ed McCurdy in 1950 in what became a popular folk song. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty room, and the room was filled with men, and the paper they were signing said they'd never fight again. But that scene had already happened in reality on August 27, 1928 in Paris, France. The treaty that was signed that day, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, was subsequently ratified by the United States Senate in a vote of 85 to 1 and remains on the books and on the U.S. State Department's website to this day as part of what Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution calls the supreme law of the land. Frank Kellogg, the U.S. Secretary of State who made this treaty happen, was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize and saw his public reputation soar. So much so that the United States named a ship after him, one of the Liberty ships that carried war supplies to Europe during World War II. Kellogg was dead at the time. So many believed were prospects for world peace. But the Kellogg-Briand Pact and its renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy is something we might want to revive. This treaty gathered the adherence of the world's nations swiftly and publicly, driven by fervent public demand. We might think about how public opinion of that sort might be created anew, what insights it possessed that have yet to be realized, and what systems of communication, education, and elections would allow the public again to influence government policy as the ongoing campaign to eliminate war, understood by its originators to be an undertaking of generations, continues to develop. So the, the story that I tell in this book comes out of what was then called the World War, the First World War, which was a, a, a period of intense disillusionment and disappointment and anger and resentment. Uh, this is a war that was, that was marketed as humanitarian, as a war to end wars, as a war to make the world safe for democracy. And the propaganda, the lies, the exaggerations uh, were largely exposed. And the horror of modern war, the level of the damage and the killing was eventually exposed. Uh, and so there, there, was, there was a great deal of resentment against a war that was thought of as, as having brought us nothing, nothing but the flu and prohibition. You know, there was nothing else we got out of it. There was resentment toward Europe these backward Europeans who start these wars and drag us into it, and we had nothing to do with it. And there was a desire to fulfill that part of the propaganda, that, that promise of making this the last war. And so after World War II, peace was something that could be seen as fulfilling the glorious promise of the war as well as something that came out of opposition to the war and realization that the war and no war could bring anything good. Uh, and, and so peace could be nationalism.
Eucharistic. It could be opposed to those evil backward Europeans. It could be patriotic. Uh, it could be funded and was funded in huge measure by robber barons like Carnegie. Uh, and, and so peace was something that, that could be mainstreamed much more easily than today. There was no military industrial complex to speak of, nothing to compare with what we've had since World War II ever growing. Uh, the, the farmers in the Midwest wanted the Europeans to stop buying so many weapons and start buying more grain. And, and so the, the farmers had more pull in Washington than the military industrial complex, which hadn't really been created yet. So you had a much, you had a much easier path toward a peace movement following World War I, and it was an incredibly mainstream movement. Everybody was for peace. Everybody was for ending war. There was, a, there was only a deep division over how to do it. Uh, and one group that you could characterize as the internationalists wanted the United States to join the League of Nations and the World Court and to build alliances with European and other countries. Uh, another group that was often called the isolationists but also included the, the outlawists, those who really wanted to outlaw war, thought that international alliances where countries group together and agree to make war on any country that starts war as a means to eliminating war was exactly what had given us World War I. It was using war to end war, just as we so effectively now use NATO or the United Nations to end war. And, and so, there, there, was, there was universal agreement that we have to end war. There was debate over, do we do it uh, in these international alliances, or do we do it by eliminating war as a tool of policy? So for the outlawists, the analogies were to, to slavery, to blood feuds, to dueling. You know, the individuals could no longer solve disputes by dueling. They had to take them to court. Well, these lawyers, in particular a lawyer named Salman Oliver Levinson, who started this movement to outlaw war, wanted to take international disputes to court, to create an independent world court that wouldn't be part of the League of Nations, that would resolve disputes, and would punish war makers, would punish the crime of making war. And, and, and the war would be eliminated as, as a respectable tool. There was a sort of understanding that, not in terms of, of, of colonizing poor countries, or there was great hypocrisy on, on, on this all the way through this period, but, but in terms of the great powers, the, the powers that had major weaponry that could compete with each other in a war, it really took two. You, you, you weren't, there was no war started purely by one party and the other was purely in defense. And, and so there would still, there would still be self-defense in this vision of a, of a world that had outlawed war, but it wouldn't be thought of as war any more than you know, defending yourself individually was thought of as defensive dueling, and you ban aggressive dueling. Uh, there, there, was, there was an idea that war would be stigmatized, it would be eliminated from the arsenal of respectable tools, uh, and those who engaged in it would be punished by popular opinion, by, by diplomacy, uh, and by a court of law, uh, which would resort to force if need be, but force against individuals, not against an entire nation. And, and, and of course, that model worked much better after World War II than punishing an entire nation. It had worked after World War I. Uh, there, were, there were some interesting uh, peace activists on the, on the internationalist side uh, of the peace movement um, that uh, worked, uh, some of them, in the, in the Carnegie Institute for Peace, uh, including a, a guy named Shotwell, who was teaching in Germany. Uh, and Germany was very pro-peace at this time. And, and went and met with the French uh, foreign minister, Aristide Briand. And, wrote a statement for Briand, ghost wrote it for him, what he should say to the press. And 
April 6, 1927, this statement to the American people from the Foreign Minister of France shows up in newspapers saying, we need to get together and outlaw war. Your, your American activists are right about this. Uh, you know, and, and one of them had actually written it. Well, this shows up in the newspapers and nothing happens. It's not news. Nobody says a thing. Weeks go by, months go by. And so his colleague, uh, a guy named Butler, who was uh, very well known and the president of Columbia University, as well as the Carnegie Institute for Peace, uh, or Carnegie Endowment for Peace, uh, wrote a letter in the New York Times uh, saying, what in the world? Where is the US government to respond to this proposal to outlaw war from, from the foreign minister of France? And, and so there was this you know, dialogue begun uh, in sort of ventriloquist fashion with the peace activists speaking for the various countries. Uh, and, and the peace activists in the, in the American peace activists in Paris, France, uh, technically illegally, but they were not prosecuted for it, uh, lobbying the French to lobby the Americans to, uh, to join in a treaty for peace. Uh, and, and so you had eventually, through all sorts of, of public back and forth, a treaty proposed uh, by, by Briand to Secretary of State Frank Kellogg, who would not condescend to respond in any way to, to these public statements. He needed to be officially contacted. Uh, but it was to be just a treaty between France and the United States. Uh, and, and from the point of view of France, you know, this would bring the United States in on its side in the next war. Uh, from the point of view of the United States, from the internationalist side of the peace movement, heck, why not? Sounds great. It says, it says we want to get rid of war. But the, the, there were those who, who were quite principled about not wanting bilateral agreements and entanglements and didn't want anything just with France. There was also a sort of a, uh, of a conflict of individuals and their own presidential ambitions. And you ended up with, uh, with Senator William Bora, our uh, Senate uh, Foreign Relations Chairman, who had never been to anywhere foreign uh, and was very much a, an isolationist and an outlawist, uh, proposed making it a treaty for the entire world, not just France. Um, and, and so you had, during, during the second half of 1927 and all into 1928, a, a, a huge push by the peace movement in this country and other countries to make this thing happen.